All right, continuing on in the tutorial, let's keep going. The tutorial node now has the interface node and an interface socket is yellow diamond shaped and you can use it to connect things like panels, buttons, labels, basically anything a user can interact with. You hold shift when you drag out and let go, it will give you recommendations of interface type data that you can connect to the interface node. Now, this data is very unique and is tied mostly to the interface, so you cannot connect yellow diamond sockets to any other type of socket except for another interface socket. The execute socket is a program type socket and you use it to create your programs. And we'll go into what nodes can start a program, but what this is, it, it makes a line from one node to another and executes operations in the program. And if you hold shift out, you can get a list of compatible execute type nodes that have an execute socket tied to them. Um, one of the most important ones that you'll see is actually the function node, but the same rule applies. You can't connect execute sockets to any other type of sockets, just another execute socket. Now functions make use of the execute socket in a great way. What you end up doing is you can declare a function node and you give it a name and it will start with an execute socket and they will block out a program which then can be executed by using a run function node and you'll just pull out from the socket, attach it to more nodes with execute sockets and you'll attach it to a return node. And the function return will execute and then you can continue on in the program. Functions have input and output parameters as well. And for the type of data that you can apply to execute sockets or interface sockets, we're gonna go over those data types now. So a string data socket allows you to type in characters or strings for the data. It will pass string type data through it. Boolean sockets will pass in Boolean values of zero or one, true or false, existing or not. Float data passes in values of floating point numbers numbers with decimals. Integer sockets obviously pass in through whole number data. List sockets will pass in lists of items or lists of data. Vector sockets will pass in data that contain vector values. Color sockets will pass in RGB color data. Icon sockets will pass in icon data for the user interface and generic data socket. You can connect any data socket to any other type of data socket in this list. On the end panel below the graphs, we have the variables tab. You can create variables in the end panel and they're tied to the graph that is active. Variables are created per node tree or per graph. Define the type and the default value here and then use getters or setters. Getters will get the value of a variable and setters will set the value of a variable. You also have a change by node that works for strings and numbers, and they can take the current value and then modify by adding or subtracting to it. There's a great button that's also tied to these called a copy, and you'll be able to copy the Python path for the variable and make use of the variable within a script. That's really powerful because that allows you to combine serpents with script code. We'll go ahead and make a variable. Click the plus button and you'll notice that it makes a new variable and it gives it a default type of a string and to the right is the copy button. Among these options you have for your variable, you can make it a string data, an integer data, a float data, Boolean list, or a blend data. And we'll get into blend data, that's coming up in the tutorial. But for here, we'll just go ahead and pick a float data type and you can name your variable. And this variable will be tied to the time recorder graph. It won't, you won't be able to use it outside of this graph. But you can give it a default value. So we'll give it something like 55.5. And every time you start up the add-on or start up a Blender session, the variable will have that value by default. Properties exist all over Blender. And you can right-click on any property in Blender that's not part of a floating menu and you can copy it for use in Serpents. You'll right click and you'll see an option at the bottom of the floating menus. When you right click, you'll be able to do a Serpents copy property. And then you can make use of a get property node to paste in what you've copied. And so for this instance, it's saying get name and it's looking for an object input. So you'll need to plug in the blend data that you'll want to get your property from basically. So I can right click on this variable here and copy the property of it. 
and I could paste it and notice how it's saying get default value. But I would need to add the blend data associated with that variable to get the value. So blend data, we've been talking a little bit about it. What exactly is blend data? Blend data is basically accessing any data that exists inside a blender and the get blend data nodes will help you with getting that data and they help you get properties on blend data nodes or blend data items. So you have like an object and then you can get blend data off of that object. Now below the variables panel, you have a properties panel and you can create properties in the end panel as well. And properties exist based upon things that they are tied to or assigned to. And the easiest way to describe this is you can assign a property to something like an object or a scene and properties are everywhere in Blender. The name of an object itself is a property. Now in the panel, you can select types of properties as well. And you'll notice the properties are very much like variables, but they can be displayed to the user. And these are things like strings, integers, floats, booleans, enums, or dropdowns. Properties are always attached to an ID object. So if you attach it to an object, every object in your Blender scene are going to have that property that you created. Similar to variables, they get getters and setters. So you can get their data or set their data. You can also use an update node, which has an execute socket. Anytime the property is updated, you can run code. When you click the plus button, you can make a new property. And these are the types of data that you can apply to a property. A string, integer, float, boolean, or an enumerator. And then you can attach it to, well, we'll give it a name first. So this property we're going to call is cooler. And we'll make it a boolean variable, obviously, and then attach the property to an object. Every object in your scene in Blender is going to have a property that has a Boolean value, whether it's called is cooler or not. And you can give the property a description. You have options to be able to hide it, um, to skip, save, or to animate. And I won't, I won't get into that in this tutorial. Maybe we'll cover that in a later video. But is a property cooler than the others? Give it that description, and then you can set its default value of either true or false. So blue means true and black means false, or zero or one basically. Blue is one, black is zero. And notice how you have a getter for the property and you have to be able to give it a blend data for the object that you're getting the property from. You have getter, setter, you have an interface checkbox that you can display to the user and they can decide about the property. And you also have an update. So when the property gets updated on an object, you can display the value and the blend data type for the object that's being updated. And that's the basics of properties. We'll get into those more later as we make the add-on. Operators are what run when you press on an interface button. And you can either make use of Blender's own internal operators or third-party operators, or you can create your own. The invoke output runs when the button is first pressed. Um, then a pop-up can be shown. After the pop-up is done, the operator output runs. Now, operators are unique because they can also have properties, but those properties can only be used within the operator's execute nodes. Adding in an operator here, you can give your operator a name, and we'll just call this custom button to save. And I'm doing this because I often forget that. And notice here you have pop-up options. So there's either no pop-up, a confirm, an actual pop-up that you can do things with, a property update pop-up, or a search pop-up. And we'll get covering some of those later. And then this is in the plus mark here. You'll notice it looks a lot like your variables. You can click on the plus and you'll add in a variable that exists with the operator itself. It just lives within the scope of the operator. So anything that's tied to the execute sockets on the operator node, you can make use of variables there. OP for operator, prop, string, and it's defaulting as a string. You click the little pencil icon and you can change um, to different types or subtypes. And you can also give descriptions and give default values. So this is just an example. I might need this, who knows? And then default value, save buddy. And that's just an introduction to the operator itself. And you can also use getters for the property that exists for the operator. You just have to make sure that they're tied to nodes that are running with the operator. 
This is something that's very cool with Serpens. We have custom icons and you can load in your own images and make icons out of them. And it's, it's part of the icons panel right below the properties. You can click the plus button and I'm just going to go ahead and pick an image that exists in my blend file right now. And I can name the icon, call it wow. And then you click on the getter and it makes an icon node and it's automatically selected on the custom but you can pick on either between custom or blender internal icons and select it from the list there's also an assets section as well and assets are anything from images to blend files that you can include in your add-on and the getter node will give you the path to that file that you can make use inside your add-on that can be really helpful so once you're done making your add-on we'll go ahead and just go to the add-ons panel on the end panel and you'll want to make sure that you fill out a description that teaches the user just a little bit about your add-on, what exactly it's used for, how to use it. So for our time recorder, obviously it's the thing which tells time. We'll get into the details on what exactly we're doing. You'll set your blend version and then you click on save add-on. And what that will do is it will compile all of your code. And if you've selected to let it zip, it will zip it all up. And you're gonna get a pop-up when you click on save add-on. And we'll ask if you'd like to directly upload it into the Serpent's Marketplace. And you can even upload the blend file, which will have all the node graphs that made the add-on in the first place. Which is nice, because then you don't have to worry about storing on your own hard drive. It will get stored up with the add-on in the Marketplace. I'll just go to the Edit Preference here, and we'll cover the Blender Marketplace just a little bit more on the Add-ons tab. And this is where other users have made add-ons, and they've submitted them to the Marketplace. I've got one that I've created as well that's part of the introductory series for Serpens, and it's called the Add-on Creation Template. You can download the Blend file, and you can also click on the Free or Donate button, and it'll take you to my Gumroad page, which this is a free template. And what it does is it... It's really handy for when you're developing your own add-on. It's got, obviously I've submitted the blend file, which helps you um, start quickly making your own add-on. It's got some menus and some UI that's already pre-built. has key maps set and um, a menu that exists in the properties panel, a uh, pie menu key map set, along with a viewport panel menu. Um, it's got an add-on preferences that's been built some color-coded organization, and dev functionality. So if you want to get that, you can go ahead and grab it. When you make your add-on, you, you can contribute to that. Now in the preferences, you'll also be able to find the packages, and these are nodes that will add functionality to Serpens. So you can basically make Serpens your own, and you can script your own nodes within Serpens using, using packages. There's documentation that's available. I would say this is a very advanced use case for Serpens, but you're more than welcome to make your own packages. And they go through the philosophy of how packages are used and uh, can contact Joshua and Finn uh, to get examples of a basic package and then you can work on creating your own. I would recommend making a few add-ons first before you get into making packages. Unless you want to jump right in. Now the system console can be really helpful when developing your add-ons and when you have errors this is a great place to go troubleshoot and it's in the window under toggle system console and you can drag it over and in order to make it go away you'd have to toggle it again but this is a where i would go and install my add-on creation template because it has a couple of tools that make it really easy to use that and i've also got an end panel so we'll just make the end panel um, also called Serpent's Helper, is it'll help you call in that console and clear it so you don't have to keep scrolling through messages. And I've added a properties panel as well, and we'll just assign that to view layer. But notice now in our visual scripting workspace, um, with my add-on helper template, you can call and clear the console. You can also clear the information panel, and you can clear the Python console as well. And these are just buttons that'll help you out I recommend getting it because it's free and I use it all the time as I'm developing the Serpents code for my own add-ons. And that is it for the tutorial series. You made it. You made it through the tutorial, which means now you know just that much more about Serpents and how things work at a very basic level and it'll help you make your own add-on.
and we'll get started in the time recorder add-on from here. So stay tuned for the next video and until then get playing around. <laughs>